السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء وعلى عليه وأصحابه ومن وله عما بعد My dear brothers I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put khair in our gathering here and to make it a source of blessing for all of us who are here both in what we take away from here and in what we communicate to those who we will meet after we leave this place. The topic of my lecture today is Be a Man. This word Rijal has come in the Quran many times. And Rijal in the Quran of course refers to gender, but it is not restricted to gender alone. Rijal is not simply the opposite of Nisa. Rijal is somebody with certain qualities. And those qualities are what we are going to be talking about today, insha'Allah. It's very important, I want to begin with a quote of mine, where I say that people listen with their eyes. They do not listen with their ears. They listen with their eyes. Because they don't care what you say until they see what you do. So we can tell anybody anything, they don't care about that. They are watching to see what we do. Very typical situation you will find in many homes in the world where the parents <coughs> tell the children, always speak the truth, do not tell lies. And then this young boy or young girl, <coughs> if there is a, ever an occasion that they tell a lie, then the parent will punish them. And the parent will say, didn't I tell you never to tell a lie? <coughs> Why did you lie? And then one day there is a phone call. And the child picks up the phone. And from the conversation of the child, the father realizes that it is somebody he does not want to talk to. So the father tells the child, Have you seen this? Does it happen? I am not here. I am not here. So the child says, Daddy says he is not here. <laughs> eh? Because you taught the child to speak the truth. So now you told the child, child speak the truth, but you demonstrated something else. You told the child always speak the truth. But you demonstrated that always does not mean always. Always means sometimes. So speak the truth when it suits you. And if it doesn't suit you, then you don't have to speak the truth. This is the actual message that the child is listening with the eyes. And that is the reason why I'm saying that it's very important for us to start off by thinking about this. Because the man of the house, the father, in some cases it is the grandfather also, in some cases maybe it's an elder brother, whoever, the man of the house, is a role model for the rest of the house. Not only for the children. He is a role model for the women of the house. He is a role model for the children who are in the house. He is a role model for everyone who has anything to do with that household. Now the question is, what kind of role model do I want to be? We have no choice about being role models. The, the minute you took that role, automatically, that is part of the role. The question only is, what kind of role model do I want to be? And that's why I thought, let us talk about the qualities of those people, the men, the Rijal, the Rijalullah, the men of Allah, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran al karim <clears throat> And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described their qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described nine qualities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم وعباد الرحمن الذین یمشون علی الارض حونا وعیدہ خاطبہم الجاہلون قالوا سلاما والذین یبیتون لربہم سجدا وقیاما والذین یقولون ربنا صرف عن عذاب جہنم ان عذابها كان غراما انها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما والذين اذا انفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقطروا وكان بين وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل ذلك يلقى ثاما يضعف له العذاب يوم القيامة ويخلد فيه مهانا إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات وكان الله غفورا رحيما وَمَنْ تَابَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَإِنَّهُ يَتُوبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَتَابًا وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَشْهَدُونَ الزُّورَ وَإِذَا مَرُّ بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِّرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَمْ يَخِرُّوا عَلَيْهَا صُمًّا وَعُمْيَانًا والذين لا يقولون ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة عين قرة عين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا أولئك يجزون الغرفة بما صبروا ويلقون فيها تحية وسلاما خالدين فيه حسنت مستقرا ومقاما الله سبحانه وتعالى describe nine qualities of those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised and he called them his men, his ibad. He called them his special slaves. Ibadur Rahman. The ayat of Surah Al-Furqan. The first of those qualities is dignity. And that is why it is extremely important for the person, for the man to have dignity. Dignity is what we call in Arabic waqar. Dignity has to do with the external appearance, how you dress and what you do and so on. And that's why one of the signs of dignity is the covering of the head. Today it seems to be, we have taken it almost as a religious obligation not to cover our head. Whereas, in Arabic, there is a term called Hasiru Ra'as. It means somebody who has no protection on his head. Rasulullah always had his head covered. There is only one hadith to the best of my knowledge where it is reported that Rasulullah prayed without his head covered and there was water which was on his head, droplets of water. So he had had a bath and he immediately prayed Wallah alam nafil and in that nafil his head was uncovered. But there is not a single hadith that I know which said that, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ever made imamat without his head covered, that he ever delivered a khutbah without his head covered. 
that he otherwise prayed without his head covered. Never. Always head covered. With a cap, with a turban, with a helmet, with a, with a, hel with a turban on a cap, with a turban on a helmet. Always. The waqar of the man. Today we have made this into almost, as I said, it's almost like one of the arkan of salah that we should pray without a head covering. Where did this come from? From where? This is not the sunnah. This is not the sunnah. It is the waqar of the man to have something on his head. Waqar is also in how we speak. What kind of jokes we make. What we do in terms of our behavior and our manners and our akhlaq. It's not only external appearance. It's our dealings. How we greet people. Do we have a smile on the face? It's part of waqar. It's part of dignity. And dignity and humility. See the, uh, the beauty of the Quran. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentioned these things. Dignity and, humi and humility. Uh, which is a... Seems to be sometimes a paradox. Because we say, well you know, it's dignity and humility. Because dignity seems to be something which is different from humility. But no. Dignity and humility because... Dignity is not arrogance. And that's the difference we, mean, we need to keep in mind. Dignity is not arrogance. Dignity is, to, is not to look down on somebody. So humility is to understand ourselves before our run. But to behave with the people in a way which is befitting a Muslim. As I said, you are a role model. As a Muslim, you are a role model. The world is looking at you and saying, that is a Muslim. He's not saying, this is Zayd, that is Bakr, this is Khalid. No, he's saying this is a Muslim. Whatever we do is interpreted today in this world as the action of a Muslim. And many times, I'm sure you would have heard this, and I have also heard this many times, where people say, why do you say it's an action of a Muslim? Why don't you say it's an action of an individual? After all, a person who's not a Muslim is also doing the same thing. You don't blame him, but you, you only blame the Muslim. You know why? Because that person did not say that I am a role model for the world. For that person, his Rabb did not say, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas came for whom? For the Hindus? For the Sikhs? For the Christians? For the Jewish people? For the atheists? For who? For whom? Muslims. Muslims. Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat minan nas or lin nas? Lin nas. Not minan nas, no? Allah did not say we took you out from the people. He said we took you for the people. Benefit of the people. For the people. Lin nas. So if we are supposed to be the standard bearers, if we are supposed to be the example for mankind, then is it not fair, is it not fair and just that mankind should say, you are the example, so be an example. Is it fair or is it not fair? What do you think? Fair. It is fair. It is fair. Allah sent us to be examples, so the people are saying, now be an example. Show us. Don't act like everybody else. Be different in a positive, good way. So we can follow you. And this is what the companions of Rasulullah the Sahaba, this is what they did and this is what they practiced. Because when somebody came to them and said, please tell me about Islam. Did the Sahabi say, please sit down. And then he said, Islam has five arkan and so on and so forth. Did he give a bayan on Islam? No. What did they say? They said, Kunu mithlana. They said, become like us. Become like us. If a person comes and says, how do I do business? He said, come to me, come to my shop, I show you how to do business. If a person says, how should I be in my home? He said, please come, I invite you to my home. Please come and spend some time in my house and see what I do. I ask myself and I ask you, my brothers, to ask yourselves, are we in this situation today? 
Can we invite people without any reservation, without any problem into our homes, into our businesses and say, please come and see. Can we do this? Maybe some of us can, maybe some of us cannot. But we need to have this as a general thing. Everybody, every Muslim should be able to say, do this. So if you as a father, if you as a man are behaving in a way which does not have dignity. For example, if you are smoking a cigarette. What do you say if your 10 year old son also says, daddy, give me a cigarette. <clears throat> what do you do if you are a smoker? I know there are no smokers here, of course. Eh? Muslims don't smoke. That's how all the cigarettes are sold in Saudi Arabia. Muslims don't smoke. Only the, only the non-Muslims in Saudi Arabia are smoking. Eh? What will you do if you are a smoker and your 10-year-old son or your 8-year-old son or your 12-year-old son or your 10-year-old daughter, right? Why do we discriminate? Says, Daddy, give me, a, give me a cigarette. What will you say? You will say, no. Why? Why? If you can smoke, they can smoke. Bad for your health. Bad for your health. But good for my health, yeah? <laughs> Bad for your health, good for my health. You get the point I'm saying, yeah? We have to live the message. My brothers and sisters, I remind myself and you, today the world all over, all the world, the non-Muslim world, you know, we all, we like to say Muslims are 25%, 20%, 25% of the population of the world. Yes, we like to, we feel good about this. Alhamdulillah, that's good. But what does it also mean? It means that 75% of the population is not Muslim. And you know what that 75% of the population is saying to you and me? They are saying we are sick of listening about Islam. We are sick and tired of listening about Islam. Don't tell us about Islam. Show us Islam. Show us Islam. I want to see this Islam. I don't want you to tell me Islam means this, Islam means that. I don't care what Islam means. I'm looking at you. You show me what is Islam. Forget about what Islam says. Forget about what Quran says. In our book, forget about it. Your book, no? So show me. Show me. Don't tell me it is written here. So what? So what? In your life, I want to see it in your life. Sometime back, a few months ago, Harvard Law School put up the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, hold yourself with respect to justice. Allah said, be a witness against yourself and against your own family. Stand up for the truth. And Howard Law School put up this eh, on, their, on their board. And they said this is the finest example of justice in the world. So what did, a, what did a lot of our brothers and sisters, what did they do? WhatsApp. Right? We WhatsApped it all over the place. BBM. Bahut badi musibat. Eh? BBM all over the place, WhatsApp all over the place, SMS all over the place. See what Harvard Business, Harvard Law School is saying. See what Harvard Law School is saying. How many of us stopped for a minute and said, Subhanallah, Harvard Law School is saying this about us. Am I practicing this in my life? Or is the or are the people of Harvard Law School are they going to become a witness against me on the day of judgment when I stand before Allah? How many of us thought about that? So the first of the qualities of the people, Ibad rahman is to be dignified. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if some foolish person says something to you, you do not respond to him in the same way. You just say, Qalu salama wida qatabahumul jahiluna you do not reply to somebody who, ha, who is speaking to you like a jahil. Second one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, People who spend the night before their Rabb, Sujjadaw wa qiyama, Walladheena yabituna li rabbihim, Sujjadaw wa qiyama, In sajda and in qiyam. My dear brothers and sisters, you can only give what you have. 
So the question that I ask myself and I request you to ask yourself is, what do you have? What do I have? How can we connect to Allah when we ourselves are not connected to Allah? And that is the reason why the first, among the first ayat of the Quran after Surah Al, after uh, Surah Al, the uh, Alaq, the first ayat which came, the next revelation was the revelation of connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way of connecting to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal muzzammilu qumil layla illa qalila nisfahu awin khus minhu qalila aw zid alayhi wa rattilil qur'ana tarutila inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thakila inna nashiyatan laylihi ashaddu wa ta'u wa aqwa muqila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh, who is wrapped in garments and sleeping, stand up. How much? Kumil layl. Stand for the whole night. Illa qalila. Except for a small part. Nisfahu wa bin qusminu qalila awzid alayh. Half the night, three quarters of the night, some less, some more. And do what? Rattilil qur'ana tartila. You know, many of us who have been to a Hiv school, what does the Ustad of Hivs, what does he do when the, uh, when the student comes every morning? What does the student do with the Ustad of What does the Ustad of Hivs, what does he do? He tells the student, all right, now recite the sabak. What did you learn? Recite. Let me hear what have you learned, how much have you memorized? Yes? That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing with his Nabi. Let me listen to your recitation. Let me listen to your sabak. What have you learnt? Recite. Eh? See the beauty of this thing. Who is reciting? The one who received the kalam. Who is listening? The one whose kalam it is. And this is the blessing that was given to us. Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu anha narrates among the asbab al nuzul of these ayat of Surah Al-Muzzamil. She said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the first 19 ayat and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal the 20th last ayah of the surah for one year. For 12 months Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the sahaba ridwanullahi alayhi majma'in prayed tahajjud like fard. They prayed tahajjud every day. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the, the last ayah. Where it was a ruksa <coughs> for the others. For the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the was farth anyway. But for the others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them some ruksa. And he revealed the last ayat of Surah Al-Muzzamil. But I can assure you that there was not one single person among those Sahaba who prayed with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that one year who would have ever left the Hajjud as long as they lived. And that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that standing in the night, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has described as one of the qualities of Yabadur Rahman. The question I want to ask you is this. Do you want to be called among the Ibad of Ar Rahman? Not by me, but by Ar Rahman himself. Do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when you are brought before him, do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say, he is my slave, this is my abd. Bring him here. This is my abd, Ahmad Fakhri. Bring him here. Ibadur Rahman. Abdur Rahman. Yasir Yusuf. Do you want to hear this from Allah Jalla Jalalu? Then stand in the night. Build that connection. Build that connection. Tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your story. Cry before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a problem, tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about it. You need something, ask Him. Because He is the only one who can give. 
Ask only Allah because only Allah likes those who ask. Third quality of the Ibad rahman which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned is accountability. This is the beauty of the bayan of the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu that it is logically arranged. That we see when we have a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is the first question in my mind? What am I going to answer to Allah? Accountability. And when we have accountability we say Oh Allah, save us from the fire. Ajar na bin Oh Allah, save us from the fire. Because this is not a temporary thing. Whoever is in the fire is in the fire forever. He's in the fire for a long, long time. So consciousness of the akhirah and that sense of accountability coming into every action of our lives. Who are the Ibadur Rahman? They are the people who live their entire lives accountable to the one from whom nothing is hidden. Fourth, generosity. Because the moment I am conscious of the akhirah, what do I do? I build my akhirah. I always tell people, this is one of my quotes which has become very famous. I tell people every Muslim must be only in one business. And what is that business? The real estate business. Building palaces in Jannah. Huh? Real estate business. So anytime anybody asks you, what is your business? You say, real estate business. I'm in real estate. Oh, mashallah. Where is your project? In Jannah. I build palaces in Jannah. Huh? But you know, we laugh because, of course, we are laughing. At you. Alhamdulillah, no problem. It's good to laugh. We should have a good sense of humor. But seriously, look at it very seriously. You know how easy or difficult it is to build a palace in Jannah? Let me tell you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one hadith, he said that in an argument, in an argument, if you are correct, listen carefully, in an argument, if you are correct, but if you give up your right for your brother, he said, I will guarantee you a palace in Wasatil Jannah, in the center of Jannah. That's it. See how this is linked to that first of those ayat which I recited. Palace in Jannah. He is cursing you. He said, Alhamdulillah, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. My palace is ready. Curse me some more, one more palace. Eh? You are doing me a favor, mashallah. I did not do anything also. You know, I, said, <laughs> I did not do anything. You, you are helping me to build palaces in Jannah. Mashallah, keep on doing it. Mashallah. No problem. Man. Because who gives izza? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To izzu man tasha wa to zillu man tasha. Somebody else cannot give me izza. Somebody else cannot take it away. Imam Shafi rahmatullah alayhi said a very beautiful thing. Imam Shafi Rahmatullah said, if you want to protect yourself from feeling hurt with unjustified criticism, do not feel happy with unjustified praise. Yeah? Beautiful uh, Imam Shafi Rahmatullah is one of the uh, great Imams and uh, he is famous for his very many wise Quotations and sayings. And this is one of them. And I, I'll repeat it for your benefit. He said, if you do not want to be hurt by unjustified criticism, he said, do not feel happy with unjustified praise. Now think about this. Many times we hear this. Somebody says, how can you say this? How can so-and-so say this about me? Huh? I never did that. But how many of us, when somebody says, Many times people introduce me. And they say, this is Sheikh Mirza Yawar Beg. And they say, he is a great scholar. Baharul Uloom. And so on and so on. And I say, la hawa la quwata illa billah. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiyo. 
I said, first of all, I'm a sheikh because my beard is white. Nothing for no other reason. Huh? I've said this many times. I'm not a sheikh. You call me sheikh, that is your problem. Alhamdulillah, you give me his, I, I don't complain, but I am not a sheikh. I know I'm not a sheikh. Because according to me, who is a sheikh? According to me, who is a sheikh? Sheikh Abul Hassan Nadwi Rahmatullah Ali was a sheikh. Sheikh Nasruddin Albani was a sheikh. Rahmatullah Ali. Imam Ahmad was a sheikh. Me? I compare myself to Sheikh Abul Hassan? Yes. As somebody who cleaned his shoes. That's it, period. Then you say, I'm a great scholar. Inna lillahi wa inna ilaha raju. So if you get used to feeling good about unjustified praise, then when you get unjustified criticism, you feel bad. So Imam Shafi said, no, no, no. Let people say whatever they say. Alhamdulillah, this is from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without you asking if somebody has praised you, Alhamdulillah, Bashara, inshallah. But don't believe that is true for yourself. Don't take it. No. Alhamdulillah, we leave it there. So when you take, when you have the reality of the Akhirah, what do you do? Generosity. We spend in the path of Allah. We spend in the path of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who guaranteed our investments. Guaranteed our investments. And what is the minimum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give? 1000%. 10 times. Not 10%. 10 times is how many percent? 1000%. Minimum. 2 700 times. 2 bi ghairi hisab. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king. Is the malik. He is the Sultan of Salatin. He does not count and give. He gives. Even if we go today to one of our kings, if you go to one of, you know, people with dignity, and if he's going to give something, have you ever seen a king, he is counting the notes and giving you? Yeah, it's beneath the dignity. If a king is doing that, you say, what kind of Sultan is this? Eh? He's a Sultan or he's an accountant? What is he? How can he count and give? Eh, you are a Sultan, just give it like this. Khalas, whatever it is. Huh? No, is this it? And what Allah will count? No, nah, man. That counting is only to help us to understand because we have small minds, small hearts. We say, how much? That's why I never ask Allah how much. Let him give. Huh? Why do you want to count? If Allah is giving without counting, you want to count? No, nah, I don't want to count. Give. Yeah, I brought something. <clears throat> I brought what I can bring. What can I bring? I can, I can bring sins. What have you got? You have got your maqfira. Allah will give generosity. So we give. And then the balance in that giving, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, don't give until you become fakir in, in this world. No, give, alhamdulillah. But ensure that you also take care of your family. Spending thoughtfully for the right causes, not just throwing money. No. Certainly not ostentation. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I have to spend. So now I have this fantastic party. Huh? And I spend a million dollars on this party. This is not spending. That's not what is meant by spending. Thoughtfully, good things. Good, do good things for people. And in Islam, remember, there is no, <coughs> there is no restriction <coughs> on who to do the good for. Not only Muslims. Do good for everybody in the world. Do good for all people in the world. Do good for the animals, do good for the environment, do good for your country, do good for the whole world. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, noble character. Again and again and again. And what is the first thing that is emphasized with regard to noble character? Tawheed. Not to bow before anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalalu. Tawheed. That is the first quality of nobility. First quality of character that we do not bow before anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Three things are mentioned in this particular, particular ayah. One is Tawheed. Second one is not to kill anyone unjustly. Which means for people like us not to kill anyone because you, an individual citizen is not allowed to kill anyone and say this is justified killing. Unless it is in self-defense, somebody attacks you, trying to kill you, you fight, you fight back and the person happens to die. It's a different matter. 
<coughs> but other than that, for us to kill anybody is not permitted. Haram. So we don't kill anybody. And third thing is good character. Good character. No fahushat, no munkarat, no fornication, no adultery. So three critical things. Tawheed, not worshipping anyone other than Allah. Not obeying anyone other than Allah. Number two is not killing and killing extends to any kind of oppression. Killing is not only taking of life. Backbiting is killing because you are assassinating the character of the person. <coughs> Ghiba. What is Ghiba? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Surah Al-Hujarat with regard to Ghiba? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that this is like eating the flesh of your dead brother. To slander somebody is like killing the person. Because you didn't kill him physically, but you killed his memory, you killed his reputation, or at least you tried to kill his reputation. So this is like murder of another kind. So any kind of oppression is haram. And the third one is adultery. Because there again you are killing a relationship. You are killing a, rela a legal, halal relationship, you are killing it. By indulging in haram. So three very, very important things that are mentioned as part of noble character. And then, the importance of tawbah. Who are Ibadur Rahman? Who, these are the people who make frequent tawbah. As we know from the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said that I make tawbah 70 times every day. And in another narration, the Sahaba said we used to count the times that Rasulullah used to make istighfar and he said we have counted up to 100. So how much should we make tawbah? Tawbah wal istighfar are two related but different things. Tawbah is to turn towards Allah. And istighfar is to ask forgiveness. Istighfar is the way in which we make tawbah. So we ask forgiveness and we turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I take stock of my life and I say that this is something that I have been doing which is wrong. I make istighfar, I say, oh Allah, please forgive me. And then I turn towards Allah by not doing that thing ever again. <clears throat> and that is the explanation given by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziya with regard to Tawbah wal istighfar, the two things that are related. And about this Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that those people who do Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that I will convert their sins into good deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will convert their sins into good deeds. You know, how can we ever thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for His graciousness and His majesty? Not only will Allah forgive, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will convert those sins into good deeds. And then the quality of the Ibadur Rahman, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that these are the people who stand for justice. They do not simply sit and watch something wrong happening. Many times people quote and explain, and in my view, explain incorrectly, the hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with respect to this matter, where they say, where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you see something evil, he said, stop it with your hand. And, and if you do not have the strength to do that, he said, speak against it. And then he said, if you do not have the strength to do that, feel in your heart that this is a bad thing. And then what did he say? He said, and that is a sign of the weakness of your iman. Yes? Now people explain this hadith and they say, there are three things you can do. Stop with your hand or speak against it 
or feel bad about it. But my submission to you is, there are only two things you can do, not three things. The third thing is actually a diagnosis of the level of your Iman. The third thing is a sign of sickness. It is not something Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is acceptable, keep it. No. It is a sign of sickness. Something is wrong with your Iman. Go work on this Iman until you can do one of these two things. You understand what I am saying? So it's not sufficient simply to say, well, you know, I was there and this was happening, but well, I, I uh, disagreed with it in my heart. I felt bad about it. Not sufficient. We are supposed to do something about stopping evil or at least speak against it. And if we cannot do both of these, it's a sign of the weakness of our Iman. And then what should we do? Go and work on that Iman and strengthen that Iman because if that Iman is so weak that it does not even, uh, does not even enable you to speak out against injustice in front of people, how will this Iman help you and me when we are dying, when we are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In this context, I want to say very clearly also that it is the duty of the Muslim to speak against injustice no matter where it is, no matter who is doing it. Even if a Muslim is doing it. Even if the victim is a non-Muslim, whose job is it to support the non-Muslim against the Muslim? Whose job? The Muslim's job. The Muslim's job. He must stop his own brother for commit, from committing that injustice against the non-Muslim. Rasulullah used a proverb that used to be in the day Alamul Jahiliya among the Arabs. <clears throat> where they said, support your brother, whether he is right or wrong. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said to the Sahaba, he said, support your brother, whether he is right or wrong. So, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, but this is a proverb from the old days. If you say, support your brother, whether he is right or wrong, they said, we understand if you say, support your brother, if he is right. But how can we support our brother if he is wrong? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi said, support your brother if he is wrong by stopping that wrong. By stopping that wrong. Because if you do not stop him from doing that wrong, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will punish him. So save him from the punishment of Allah by correcting him in this world. And this was the beautiful way of teaching of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he would use something to excite the mind of the people so they will ask a question and then he would explain from the question. So he said, support your brother, even if he's wrong. Say, yes, how can we do that? By stopping that wrong. Not by supporting the wrong, by stopping the wrong. So stand for justice. And then, people accepting their own mistakes. When they are reminded of the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do not deny those ayats. They do not justify their wrong. They do not say, oh, but you know, this is not what I meant and so on. No, no, no. When they are reminded of something, they say, yes, I agree. And they stop themselves from doing that. And they are not deaf and they are not blind to the hidayat and to the correction that comes to them. And then the people who make dua, The people who have connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who make dua. And what is the beauty of this dua? The beauty of this dua is this dua is focused to the future. So oh Allah help us to carry forward this message. Give us children, give us wives who will be a coolness of our eyes. Give us children who will be a source of pride for us, a source of satisfaction for us. Do not give us children who are a musiba for us. Do not give us spouses, wives and husbands who are a problem for us. Give us wives and husbands who are a source of rahmah for us. And make us the imam, the aima of the muttaqun. Not the whole world. People who are muttaqun. My brothers and sisters, dua is to take from the treasures of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to give to the rest of the world. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Muslims to take from his treasures and to give to the world. Allah sent the Muslims to help the world to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't send us to scratch in the dirt like chickens and run behind everything else which people are running behind. No. He sent us, he gave us the tool to take from his treasures. And what is that tool? What is it called? Dua. Salah is dua. Salah is dua. And this is the sign of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Rijalullah. The Ibadur Rahman. And then when you do all of this, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise? Ulaika yujuzawna al-ghurfata bima sabaru. وَيُلَقَّوْنَ فِيهَا تَحِيَّةً وَسَلَامًا خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا حَسُنَتْ مُسْتَقَرًّا وَمُقَامًا Allah said they will be rewarded with the highest place in Jannah because of their sabr. And there they will be greeted with salam. And there they will stay in a beautiful place forever. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this our qadr inshallah and to write this for all of you who are here and for all of your families who are not here or who are here and for all the people, all the Muslims I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to write this as our qadr that we will be gathered together in Jannatul Firdaus with Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment inshallah. I will end, I want to end with a gift for you. And this is my gift. I call it the power of one. And what is that one? One degree more. Little bit more. I want to show, to you, show you how it is so easy to succeed in life. It's not difficult. Very easy. All you have to do is make a little bit more effort. In 2008... In the men's 800 meter race in the Olympics, the difference between the gold medal and no medal, I'm not talking about gold and silver, gold and bronze, gold medal and no medal, the difference was 0.29 seconds. 0.29 seconds. Huh? In the Indy 500 200, 2008 car race, the difference between the first and second place was 1.7 seconds. The difference in prize money was $1,714,000. My brothers, only one degree separates the good from the great. I'm not talking about the good and bad. I'm talking about the good and the great. One degree. Take for example water. At 99 degrees, water is hot. At 100 degrees, it boils. Boiling water produces steam. Steam can power an engine. At 99 degrees, nothing will happen. At 100 degrees, an engine will move. Matter of one degree more. Between growing up and growing old, there is a window of opportunity which can make a difference in our lives. Growing up and growing old. When we are very young, very small, small children, I call all small children net energy drain. I've got nothing against them, but I, you know, they are no good to nobody. I mean, they're just taking things, right? And then when we go beyond a certain age, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of you a long and very healthy and productive life, inshallah. But for many people, after you are maybe 70 or something, you go back to being a net energy drain. You know, getting up is a problem and so on and so forth. May Allah give us good health, inshallah, always. Eh? So there is a short period of time, few years, between, between growing up and growing old, when we can actually make a difference. And remember, once that window is closed, then our life is effectively over, even if we remain alive. Because living is not simply to breathe. 
Living means to be effective, to do something. What is the difference between the lion and the antelope? The same difference between ordinary light and laser. And that difference is the same difference between the leaders and the rest. And that is focus. Ordinary light at best illuminates. Laser cuts through steel. Same thing. And that's why I say if you want to get what you never had, you have to do what you never did. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. Results come from actions and actions define you. And that's why I say to you, it's your life. And you are responsible for the results. Not anybody else. To face life's challenges, I want to give you this gift. And that is six tools to succeed. Number one, to remember that your thoughts make you. We become what we think. Your mind is like a fertile field. It doesn't care what you plant in it, but it will give you whatever you plant. You plant rice, you get rice. You plant wheat, you get wheat. You plant rice, you want wheat, you no get. <laughs> Second one is attitude. Present circumstances do not decide if you will succeed or fail. Present circumstances only decide where you need to start. Present circumstances, many times people say, well, you know what, I had no opportunity. Everybody has opportunity. We know people who have no arms and legs who have become highly successful motivational speakers. We got, we got a guy on YouTube, you can see his, his video somewhere. No arms, no legs. You ask him, what, tell us something about it. He says, oh, life is fantastic. It's a very joyful thing. He says, subhanAllah, ajeeb, eh? No arms, no legs. Life is joyful. Attitude in the mind. Third one, faith. I like to use a quote of uh, this famous writer called Barbara Winters. It's a beautiful quote. And Barbara Winters said, When you come to the end of the light of all that you know, and are about to step off into the darkness of the unknown. Faith is knowing, not believing, knowing that one of two things will happen. There will be something firm to stand on or you will be taught how to fly. And the creator of Barbara Winters, he said, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَةً وَيَرْزُقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلَ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the one who has taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide for him from sources that he could not even imagine. And the one who has tawakkul on his rab, his rab will become sufficient for him. And the next one is to have a goal. And what kind of a goal? An extraordinary goal. Why an extraordinary goal? Because it is in the nature of the extraordinary goal to inspire extraordinary effort. Nobody rises to low expectations. People rise to high expectations. And that's why it's very important to have extraordinary goals. My definition, definition of an extraordinary goal is something which everyone else will tell you is impossible to achieve. Cannot be done. Then you are on the right track. I'm not saying just have that goal. You have to work backwards from that goal, create a strategy of how to do it, create the resource bank to how to do it. But remember that at every stage, people are going to oppose. And you know why they oppose? Because you scare the daylights out of them. Because they look into your eyes and they see what they also could have done, but they gave up. But you know also what happens. If you stick with your idealism, if you refuse to compromise, if you stay with that, you will find that that spark of idealism which is in the heart of every single human being gradually starts gaining strength. And the same people who used to oppose you will stand by your side and they will walk with you. 
that also is inevitable. And the last of these tools is perseverance. And what is perseverance? Perseverance is to rise every time you fall. The race, as they say, does not end when you fall. The race ends when you do not get up. The boxing match does not end when you fall. It ends when you stay down. And the final one is honor. Now what is honor? Honor it does not depend on whether you won or lost. Honor depends on which side you fought on. My brothers and sisters, every people can win in all kinds of ways. Through corruption, through lying and cheating and so on. That is not winning. That is dishonor. The true winner is the one who wins in the right way. Islam is focused on the end and the means, both. The goal and the means. In Islam, we believe that the means does not justify the goal. And the goal does not justify the means. The right goal with the right means. And that is what is honor. And that's why I say, <clears throat> it's not important who you want to be. What is important is, who wants to be you. There are two kinds of people in this world. Those who look for ways to succeed and those who tell you why they couldn't succeed. So it's up to you, up to me, what we want to do. And that's why my personal motto in life, which I want to share with you and give you as a gift is, I will not allow what is not in my control to prevent me from doing what is in my control. I will not allow what is not in my control to prevent me from doing what is in my control. Because this is the game that many of us, psychological game we play. We say, well, you know, what can I do? After all, I am one person. You are one person? Do what one person can do. Whatever it is. My time ends at one o'clock and it is now two minutes to one. So I am uh, ending within my time. Uh, that's the standardbearersacademy.com, the website. Do go to the website and browse there. Um, and that's my Twitter. My um, email, of course, I think everybody has, yawarbeg at gmail.com. And you can get it from the site as well. Jazakumullah khairan. As always, it's a great pleasure to be in Malaysia, my favorite country in the world. And I always, that's why you find me here all the time. And uh, Jazakumullah khairan for inviting me. I thank uh, iMuslim for inviting me. I'm greatly honored. And I thank my dear brother, Sheikh Ahmad, Abu Ahmad, Ahmad Fakhri for introducing me. And uh, he's a very, very dear friend of mine and uh, a source of inspiration for me from all the work that he does. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.